Good morning, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, today is the 117th uh, anniversary of our church. It started in 1903. We were, we were called the Methodist Episcopal uh, Church then. It was organized by the Pasadena District um, uh, Reverend Superintendent and 34 other people and met in a um, meeting room on the second floor of a uh, store building in Glendale Avenue and Wilson with Pastor Charles Russell Norton as the first uh, pastor. The building had been uh, replaced by Glendale Civic Center today. The rest of the story is history. Here are the announcements for this morning. This is announcement number one. I personally would like to invite you to the Chandra's class meetings. We meet between 12.30 and 1.30 on Thursday afternoon on Zoom. What you need to do is to email Sherry Siobhan for your email address. Second announcement we have, we'll be having a brand new website which will be improved over a previous one. It'll be dynamic and you'll really enjoy it. This is announcement number three. We are looking for volunteers to do a lot of watering around the plants and weeding. You need to contact Ardell at the church for your volunteer service. This is announcement number four. The uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, project done is, is still in the process. We are still accepting all the donations. The Challenger class did participate and we, and we invite you to participate. We are still accepting photos from the few you folks and in the community, and here are some of the photos. Everyone, my name is Dave Loftus and I want to invite you to our church service this morning for 117 years anniversary. When it comes to giving, our numbers don't always add up. We see how small we are and how great the need is, and the math doesn't seem to make sense. It's easy to think our gift won't matter, but God is not only the great physician, He's the great mathematician. When we think addition, God thinks multiplication. He has bigger plans for our gifts because He makes blessings multiply. He didn't feed only five people with five loaves of bread. He fed 5,000 with plenty to spare. When we trust God enough to give generously, we invite Him to pour grace upon grace until our gift grows in ways we could never imagine. He takes our gift, big or small, and multiplies the impact, touching the world with His love on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe it's time you let God do what He does best and multiply the blessings He has given you. What blessing will God multiply today? Because you trust Him enough to give.
Greetings and welcome to worship here at Glendale First United Methodist Church. It's our joy, even our privilege, that you've chosen uh, to experience this worship service. It's our hope, it's our prayer that during this time that God's Spirit will be revealed to you and that you will better be able to appreciate the love that God has for you, the grace and forgiveness that God offers, that you'll also be able to better understand the calling that God has on you and on your life and how you might more fully live into that. Today is a joyful day here at the church. It is the 117th anniversary of this church beginning. Now, I'm sure none of us thought we'd be celebrating like this or even want to, but nevertheless, uh, it is a great day, and we do give thanks for all the people for over a century who have helped to make the ministry here possible and to help it continue. And then, God willing, at our birthday next year, we'll be able to truly have the celebration that we desire. So with that, as we begin to worship, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you would come that you would come to us wherever we are, whenever we might be experiencing this service, and that you would make yourself known, that you would reveal yourself to us so that we can better understand who you are, so that we can better understand the loving nature that you have, and that we can better accept the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the acceptance that you offer to all your people. So gracious God, be at work and also help us to be open to it so that we might receive as well. So that through all that happens in this time, it may truly be your will. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray, amen. Call to worship. God, you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted, they trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. God, you are holy. All praise to you, now and forever. Oh 
Every time we gather, we remember the love, the grace, and the forgiveness that God offers to us. But we also remember that there are things that we have in our lives, there are things about our very nature that separate us from God, that being sin. Those times that we willfully and knowingly do those things that we shouldn't, and also those times when we should do something and we simply choose not to. But in the midst of that, let us join together in this prayer of confession as we seek to reconcile ourselves to God and as we remember God's willingness to always be reconciled to us. Let us pray. We have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. Jesus, God's Son, our Savior. Therefore, with confidence, let us confess our sin. Let us pray. God of justice and mercy, we confess that we put ourselves first and trust in things that will not last. We desire the evil and scorn the good. We gather up power and wealth and push aside the needy in our way. O Lord, be gracious to us in spite of our great sin. Teach us to love your justice and share in your mercy. Help us to seek the treasure of heavenly life with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, God's Son, our Savior, for it is in him we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our gospel reading will be found on Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what might I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all this since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when I heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, Look, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks to be God. Today we're continuing our sermon series where we're exploring the idea, the trait, the value of generosity and understanding how it for us is is not just a good thing to do, a good value to have, a good way to be, but it's a character, it's an attribute of Jesus Christ and as his followers that we are called to be as he is. And so with that, that we are called to be a generous people as well. Today, as we heard in our scripture reading, we heard from the gospel according to Luke, which this story is also in Matthew and Mark as well, of the rich young ruler about this young man, this wealthy young man uh, that we don't know a whole lot about, but nevertheless, he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, he says, good teacher, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And what's really fascinating in this is what Jesus says back to him. So as Jesus begins to speak with this young man, he asks him if he has followed the law, because they all would have been uh, faithful Jews, Jesus, and this young man uh, would have been that, and they would have known of the laws of what we know as the Old Testament, the, the, the Ten Commandments in particular. And what's fascinating in this are the particular ones that Jesus lifts up to him. Jesus says the following beginning in verse 20. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And then the rich young ruler replies, I have kept all these since my youth. Now, if you're noticing in this, that's not ten commandments that Jesus listed there. He only listed five. And as I've come to learn that Jesus doesn't do anything just coincidentally, but he does them with purpose. Now, you may not know this, but the Ten Commandments, as they were written, are generally viewed as being broken out in two ways, as being uh, one tablet and then the other. Uh, Some of you may be thinking of uh, Mel Brooks and his 15 Commandments, but that's another sermon entirely. And so with the Ten Commandments, they're not just broken up evenly five and five. Instead, they're broken up four, the first four, and then the latter six. The first four dealing with how it is that we are to relate to God. What are those specific things that we are to do to improve, to keep, to honor our relationship, our commitment with God? And then the last six are those ones that we use, that we have, that we're instructed to follow in order to be in right relationship with one another. And so with that, if you look back at that, Jesus only lists five of those commandments. Let me read to you what the full six of them are. So the Ten Commandments of the second tablet go as follows. Honor your father and mother, which Jesus said. You shall not murder, which Jesus said. You shall not commit adultery, which Jesus said. You shall not steal, which Jesus said. You shall not bear false witness, 
which Jesus said. But then the last one was, you shall not covet, which Jesus didn't say. So again, once the rich young ruler says in verse 21, I have kept all these since my youth, then Jesus says, there is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he, the rich young ruler, heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. As I look at this interaction that Jesus has with the rich young ruler, I understand it to be a particular interaction. While it does have universal applications and it does speak to all of us, I think for this young man it was a particular issue that he was struggling with. For him, he had been faithful in following the law and doing everything that he thought he was supposed to do um, to be a good person, to, to have eternal life. But when he is confronted with Jesus, with the truth of Jesus, he sees the struggles, the folly, the, the sin he still has in his own life. And Jesus, of course, knowing all, is very much aware of this as well, which is why he says what he does. So he paints the picture of Jesus where he shows to this young man what the laws are, and the young man says, yes, of course I do these things. But then Jesus points out to him the one which is omitted, the one which both Jesus leaves out and also this young man has left out in his way of living, in his way of being. And it's when he is confronted with this when Jesus points this out to him, it's in that moment he realizes this flaw. He realizes this struggle that he has. And Jesus points it out to him that, that this is where you're struggling. This is where you're, you're really falling down. This is the thing that you're just choosing to ignore because it's something that, that you frankly don't want to do. And so Jesus points out to him, if, if you really want to have eternal life, if you really want to, to live fully in relationship with God, then, then this is something you need to deal with, you need to address. So take all that you have, all these possessions that you have uh, put your trust in, that you love, that have caused you to uh, damage, damage relationships with other people, take them and give them away. Sell them and then give those proceeds to those most in need. And then when you do that, then you will truly be able to live into this. And what's really heartbreaking in that moment is that when confronted with that truth, that the rich young ruler becomes very sad because he realizes the foolishness, he realizes the blindness that he's had to this issue. And rather than dealing with it, rather than taking that advice, that guidance, that command that Christ is giving him, he instead turns and walks away. And I would like to believe that he eventually realizes what he should do and that he does it and lives in um, to what Christ is calling him to, but frankly, we don't know. Jesus then goes on to tell the story about how it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person, a rich person, to enter into heaven. Now, I've heard stories growing up, I've heard it preached in sermons, where uh, there, in biblical times, there was a gate called the Eye of the Needle that entered into the uh, ancient city of Jerusalem. It was a small gate, and because of that, if you were going to bring a camel in, it would have to get down on its knees, and it would have to crawl in, basically, into this, uh, being this idea of to enter into the kingdom as a wealthy person, you would have to do it with a sense of humility. Um, and while that might be a great story, it's just frankly not true. I mean, there's no historical evidence that, that there was any sort of gate like this. These are hard words for us to hear, particularly in the West, where in a global perspective, we are all wealthy. My understanding of what Jesus is saying to us in this is that, that far too often that, that we can be happy or even willing to put our trust in Christ, to be willing to follow those things that he calls us to do when they may be things that are easy, when they may be things that uh, we're doing anyway, when they may even be things that, that we want to do. But when it comes to the point of doing things that are difficult, when hearing Jesus' words speak to something in our life where to follow in Christ would be painful or difficult or require suffering or sacrifice, 
It's in those moments where we often turn a blind eye or a deaf ear, and we simply want to leave that out. But I believe it's in these moments, it's in these moments especially where Jesus speaks to us, where Jesus comes to us, not from a perspective, as I understand it, to, to chastise us or to demonize us, but because I believe that God and God in Christ truly want the best for us, to truly want to have the best and fullest life possible, a life lived in them. But to do that doesn't simply happen coincidentally. It takes intention. It takes effort. It does take sacrifice. Because if we think we want to be like Christ, if his life was shown to us as being the life of perfect sacrifice, then how can we expect that ours will be anything less? Now, this is a story, this is a message that speaks powerfully to me as well. As I've come to study and explore the scripture, I've come to understand it as Jesus doesn't just call us to trust him in lesser things, things of little importance or little impact, but Jesus truly calls us to trust him in everything. I think we've all seen in this time of pandemic and upheaval that it's easy for us to want to have as much as we can, to, to even want to hoard our resources because we're scared, because we're afraid of what might happen. We can have a little, if any, confidence of those around us, of those above us, and so we want to be able to protect ourselves as much as possible. I think in the scripture and in the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, it's in these moments especially that Jesus is calling us to not trust in ourselves, to not trust in what we have, but to trust in him. And to be those people requires us to intentionally open ourselves, to intentionally be giving of ourselves, to be engaged in that practice of generosity so that we don't fall back into that inward looking way of being so that we can truly live in him. One of the most powerful ways that I've seen this in my life and in my ministry is that as I've shared part of the story before, when I began serving in the local church, I served for two years in a three-point charge where I was serving three churches at the same time, at three very small rural churches. And I, as I was doing that, I struggled with that. I, I don't feel like I was doing a very good job. There were just a lot of difficulties. There was a lot of hardships in those communities, and I didn't feel like I was doing much to make it better. The truth was I didn't really understand what my role was at that time, but again, that's for a later conversation. After being in that for those two years, after really struggling with those difficulties, after not feeling good about myself or how I was doing in ministry, I really began to question whether or not I was called to do this. And so I began to look, to look for ways where I could still be in it, but where I could maybe back out a little bit, to maybe back myself out some where I wouldn't be as exposed, where I wouldn't be so vulnerable, frankly, where I could be a little more in control and I could do things more my way. And in the midst of that, potentially feel better about myself and about what I was doing. So for me, what that looked like is I went from being an elder to being a deacon. And I, I'm not saying anything negative about deacons in and of themselves. I have many good and dear and wonderful friends who are deacons that do wonderful ministry. But in the Methodist church, for us, one of the big differences between deacons and elders, which are the two types of ordained clergy we have, is that deacons are able to choose their location, their type of ministry, and where they do it. And elders uh, are more generalized in their ministry, usually, but are also appointed by the bishop. And for me, I wasn't willing to let that be out of my control. I wanted to be able to choose where I was going. I wanted to be able to say where I was going to be, um, partly because there were some places in Oklahoma I didn't want to go, uh, but also because I wanted to be able to put myself in a place where I could be successful where I could feel good about that. And in that, the reality was, is I wasn't willing to trust that into God's hands. I needed to keep that for myself. And so I did. I made that transition, I became a deacon, and I served in that capacity for, I believe, six or seven years. Now, God is always gracious, God is always kind, God is always loving, and God was still at work with me in the midst of that. And thankfully, I was able to have some amazing opportunities and to grow and to flourish and to really begin to understand uh, who I am and who God has called me to be and how I'm called to be in ministry. 
But then eventually I came to realize that the reason that, that I left being an elder wasn't because my call had changed. It's because I was unwilling to accept the fullness of it. Because I was unwilling to accept the truth of what Jesus was asking of me. And frankly, I just wasn't willing to give it to him. And so after struggling with that, for those seven years, I eventually was one willing to, to acknowledge that and to say that, that it wasn't God that made a mistake, it's, it's that I did, and I did so because of my fear and my desire to control things, and that to be faithful to God, I needed to do something else. And so it was at that point that I switched back to being an elder. I um, pursued that form of ministry. I became fully itinerant again. I was moved several different places. And in all of those, they turned out to be a wonderful and amazing blessing. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say that, that everything was, you know, milk and honey and roses and everything was great and there were no difficulties and, and there were no struggles anywhere. That, that's absolutely not true. But I was able to, in the midst of that, by making myself more vulnerable, by being willing to trust more in Jesus and less in myself, it pushed me to being in places, it put me um, in a place of relying upon God that made me much more open and much more willing to allow God to be at work in my life. To really open myself made room for God to be at work. And in that, I have grown in that time in ways that I've never thought possible. I've been able and open to being engaged and functioning in type of ministries and different capacities of leadership that, that I never would have chosen for myself. And out of those have seen wonderful blessing. Jesus doesn't call us to trust him in some things. Jesus calls us to trust him in all things. Jesus doesn't call us to trust him with part of our lives. Jesus calls us to trust him with all of our lives. For us, for many of us, for most of us, one of those ways, one of those areas of our lives where we most want Jesus to frankly just keep his nose out of it has to do with our money and with our wealth. Oftentimes that area is, frankly, as we see it, nobody's business but our own. In my experience, what I've seen is in those places where we are close to Jesus being involved, are those places that can become the most damaging to us in our relationship with others and especially in our relationship with God. I believe this is why Jesus speaks so much to, to material wealth and to money in his ministry being, again, his second most talked about topic. Understanding that part of our nature as human beings is, especially as it relates to that area, to close ourselves off and to even see other people not as being good and valuable in and of themselves, but as being means to help us to achieve more wealth for our own. I believe that's why generosity is such an important trait, an important attribute of Jesus Christ for us to deal with, and for us to grapple with, especially in this time of worry and fear and anxiety, because it is in these times that we are so much more likely to focus only inwardly and to see others as a threat. It's my hope, it's my prayer for us as we go throughout the series, as we go throughout the rest of our lives, that we can truly seek to take on this character of Christ, particularly as it relates to the giving of ourselves and of what we have. To be open and willing and able to see that modeled perfectly for us in Jesus Christ. And most of all, for us to seek to allow him to live in us in all that we do. And that's what I believe this day. In the name of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now is an opportunity that we have to demonstrate, to actually live out our generosity by giving back to God a portion of what we have received, what has been entrusted to us for the sake of God's work in the world. Uh, You'll see on the screen before you the ways that we have to give here at Glendale First, and I encourage you to check those out. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have entrusted us with so much, but it's easy for us to confuse or to believe that all we have is, is frankly our business and none of yours, because it's been through our work, it's been through our efforts, it's been through our labor, and so it's simply ours. We forget that you have given us the opportunities that we have, you have given us the abilities that we have, and that you're at work in the midst of that, and that you call us as your people to love you as we love others, and that in loving others, we demonstrate, again, our love for you. So gracious God, bless these gifts that are given this day. Bless those who give them. Multiply these gifts as truly you can so that they might be able to fully do your work in the world. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. No matter where we are, no matter what it is that we're experiencing in our lives, we can always go to the Lord in prayer. One thing that I'd like to make sure that we're all keeping in our prayers is the passing of Don Gallagher as he passed away this past week. I encourage you to be praying for Mary and for their family as well, especially during this difficult time, as well as all those, uh, many of you who Don was a powerful figure uh, in your life and just for the mourning that so many are experiencing.
So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you as your people who are, who are in need, that are experiencing a great deal in our lives, whether it's the pandemic, the wildfires, the mourning of those close to us who have gone on to glory. There's much pain and suffering. It's easy for us to feel like we're alone or isolated and that no one cares, but we remember that you do, that you are always in us and with us, seeking to provide comfort and compassion and healing, and also that you work through your people so that we might be able to be your witnesses, we might be able to show you to others by providing that care and comfort for others as well. So gracious God, help to heal us. Help us to share your healing with others so that we truly may be able to help your fullness of life be experienced by all and that we might truly help to realize your kingdom. And as we pray all of these things, we also pray the prayer that your son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
just as a reminder for everyone, we're continuing to explore what outdoor corporate worship would look like here at the church. Tentatively, we're planning on starting that uh, towards the end of October on possibly the 25th. But I encourage you to stay tuned as we uh, will be releasing more information about that very soon. But one way you can do that is our new website that is being uh, worked on diligently and will soon be available for you. So with all of that, and as we go forth back into our lives, wherever that might lead us, we remember, we remember the call on Christ, the call that Christ makes on all of our lives to not follow him partially, but fully, to not give to him just some of ourselves, but all of ourselves, remembering that in him, that he gave all of himself to us and the difference that made for all. In the name of God, in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen.